right, so I'll give two more minutes to people and then and then we'll kick off. Okay. All right. So I would suggest that we we slowly start. Um, I will then admit people in, in the bigger groups. So uh, first of all, welcome everyone. It's very nice to see very nice to see many of you here today. Um, so today we have a special guest, um, and our guest is uh, Julia Reda. Um, Julia is a good friend and a former member of the European Parliament. And I think she's very special in several ways. Um, so first of all, she's a former MEP, but she's a former MEP and for our purposes, she's a, polit so she's a former politician, obviously, but a politician that uh, was mostly, I think, dealing with digital rights in her agenda. Um, and that is obviously something not uh, so common these days. Uh, you still have politicians mostly dealing with other issues and perhaps secondarily or third, fourth, fifth year, they deal with digital rights. Um, so she's she's politician in our domain. Um, well, second, she's also special because she now quit being a politician and transitioned to the NGO world where she tries to change things uh, through litigation, strategic litigation through um, trying to intervene in the uh, political process from the outside now, not as a, as a member um, of the parliament, but as, a, as an outsider. So I think that already allows her to, um, to compare the difference between making a difference as a politician and making a difference as a, as a person in civil society. But but in addition to these two, I think Julie is also special because I always felt already when she was a member of the parliament that she's also very much of an academic at heart. Um, so not only me, but many people in the academic community when we, dis we were discussing with Julia during the copyright reform, um, many different issues, we always felt like finally uh, someone on the other side at least understands what we are talking about. Not only understands, I, I actually clearly remember when I was um, pitching my paper and my solution, you know, the world problems to Julia, she totally saw through it in two minutes, which, you know, it's a quite a, uh, quite a skill. Uh, it was a very dense paper. So I have to say she combines really uh, political sort of civil society and also academic interest in one, and obviously with her focus on digital rights, she's just the perfect person to talk to us about how to make difference when it comes to digital rights. So Julia, uh, we're really delighted to have you today. Very much looking forward to hear from you and uh, also to the discussion that will follow. And you know, I won't waste any more time um, of our participants and I'll give floor right to you, Julia. Yes. Thank you very much, Martin, for this very kind introduction and uh, also for giving me the opportunity to speak in an academic setting, uh, even though I have an agenda. I'm not going to lie about that uh, now uh, as pursuing fundamental rights litigation in the NGO field. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you about, well, how I ended up there, why I think it's important to uh, have a greater attention to fundamental rights impact of copyright law today, but especially in the future uh, as some changes to copyright law are going to go into effect. So um, Martin has already covered uh, important biographical details. So I was a member of the European Parliament 
while uh, the DSM copyright directive was uh, being enacted. And I think it's also no secret to say that uh, I was one of the foremost critics of its Article 17, uh, which changes the liability regime for online platforms, which in my view, aside from the provision on uh, neighboring right for press publishers is probably the most um, contentious one when it comes to questions of impact on fundamental rights. Um, I was uh, elected for Germany and in Germany, I also um, helped mobilize for quite significant street protests against uh, upload filters. So the fear was that uh, because Article 17 of the Copyright Directive is going to make uh, platforms directly liable for uh, copyright infringements committed by their users unless they make best efforts to prevent those copyright infringements on um, request of rights holders that uh, there is going to be a significant amount of overblocking because uh, the technology at the end of the day is not capable to uh, make the evaluations of context that are necessary to distinguish between copyright infringements and legal content. So um, I don't think looking back on these protests now that they were entirely in vain. I mean, obviously the copyright directive was adopted but um, I think the, uh, the wording of Article 17 and also the overall sort of balance of the directive was changed quite significantly in the final days uh, of the uh, negotiations and quite a lot of user rights safeguards were added, um, such as, for example, making the copyright exception for caricature, parody and pastiche mandatory and recognizing how important this exception is for freedom of expression. So when I left the parliament, I was thinking about, OK, does this mean then that uh, all of these uh, minor successes that we have had in bringing more balance to the copyright regime are just going to lead to better protection of users in practice? And I was actually quite unsure about that because uh, what I had learned from discussions in, in the parliament and also trying to look at uh, how the older copyright regime had worked, the InfoSoc Directive from 2001, I found that even when there are user rights on paper, they are not necessarily enacted in practice. And um, one reason for that is that quite often uh, the users of online platforms or more broadly of copyright exceptions are not necessarily in a position to litigate uh, and have their rights enforced. And uh, there's even some lack of clarity to what extent uh, the benefit of a copyright exception even qualifies as a right. So I decided that it would be necessary not just to participate in the um, discussion on national implementation of the copyright directive, but actually to um, prepare for being able to litigate for users' rights once this directive comes into effect. And um, so immediately after the parliament, I was in the United States. I spent um, a couple of months at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. And while I was there, I sort of um, did research on strategic litigation more broadly on its origins. Like in the US, there's a very rich tradition of uh, strategic litigation. Um, it's been very successfully used by the civil rights movement, uh, for example. And also, um, yeah, I've uh, started to network and get an overview of the strategic litigation community in Europe, where a lot of it is uh, environmental organizations such as Client Earth, um, or uh, also um, more recently, there has been uh, quite uh, a strong push towards uh, strategic litigation in the field of data protection uh, with people like Max Schrems. And so um, I actually applied uh, with the Shuttleworth Foundation to do a fellowship uh, to start a strategic litigation project uh, on copyright and fundamental rights. And um, luckily the Shuttleworth Foundation accepted me as a fellow and I joined uh, the Society for Civil Rights in Germany. So Society for Civil Rights is one of the leading um, fundamental rights litigation NGOs um, in Europe, I would say. And um, it has started mostly doing constitutional complaints. So for example, you may have heard of uh, the GFF uh, successful constitutional complaint against the German secret service law. 
which was quite uh, groundbreaking because the constitutional court for the first time clarified that the German state, so the German secret service, is actually bound by fundamental rights when acting abroad. Um, but uh, more recently, GFF has also started uh, doing litigation in the civil law fields, uh, for example, on equal pay um, against an employer uh, and uh, issues around gender-based discrimination. So I joined uh, Society for Civil Rights about a year ago with my uh, uh, project Control Copyright, which is its main goal is to make sure that we don't get a situation of overblocking where basically the use of copyright exceptions or the public domain disappears as a consequence of automated enforcement of copyright on the internet. Um, <coughs> Uh, so the reason why I worry about uh, this new provision, Article 17, and its impact is going to have on freedom of expression on online platforms is partially motivated by some of the problems that we're already seeing with those upload filters that are being voluntarily used on online platforms uh, today. So I just want to give you a few uh, practical examples from different online platforms of the types of issues that we are seeing. Um, so in one case, uh, I talked to a group of Turkish exile journalists who are running a YouTube channel from Germany, who um, are basically doing reporting critical of the Turkish government and started receiving uh, copyright claims from a Turkish state TV station, where it was relatively clear that actually no copyright infringement had happened, but at least temporarily such false claims uh, would lead to critical reporting being removed from YouTube. And in this context, I think it's important to say that um, it's easy to tell people, well, you don't have a fundamental right to be on YouTube, but actually, especially if you're dealing with um, uh, critical reporting and autocratic regimes, for example, um, social media sites such as YouTube or Facebook are quite often the last uh, websites to be blocked because uh, they are very popular, they are used by lots of people. So sometimes actually being on YouTube is not just useful for the reach that you have, but also because it allows you to reach an audience which you may not reach um, if you were running a private website. So I think it's actually quite important for freedom of expression. Um, another example, so this is from a Wall Street Journal investigation, which found that there are these so-called reputation management companies. So this is not state censorship or uh, sort of state motivated censorship, but it's rather cases where private individuals are trying to clean up their uh, online history. And this investigation found uh, that these companies basically create uh, uh, fake websites where they, uh, if there is a newspaper article about you that you want to re have removed from uh, internet sources, like from Google search, that they would basically make a copy of this article backdate it to a time before the original was published and then send a copyright claim to remove the original. So this is another way that uh, private companies may be trying to abuse automated copyright enforcement on the internet. Um, another example, this is perhaps a little bit mo more mundane, is that uh, even if nobody is trying to manipulate anything, Upload filters do make mistakes when it comes to copyright uh, exceptions. So this is an example of a video that was blocked where uh, a lawyer was analyzing whether a certain um, music um, song from a German rapper or a German musical artist uh, violated um, the law. And in order to do so was basically quoting every line from the original video and uh, analyzing it, which uh, was automatically blocked, even though arguably it could be covered by the quotation exception. Or in the UK framework, uh, you have the example of the Marsh family whose video was um, muted temporarily for copyright infringement. They basically do parody songs, in this case of um, Leonard's Cohen Hallelujah. And um, they did so in order to basically 
ask people to get vaccinated. So uh, I, this is also a problem here because uh, it's not always super clear uh, which uses are covered by copyright exception. So for example, in the UK, you have fair dealing for caricature, parody, and pastiche. And it would actually be very interesting to, to uh, see whether such a case is actually covered by fair dealing. But I think there are quite a lot of um, elements of these cases that would indicate that it might be. In this case, they wrote the lyrics themselves. They played the instruments themselves. They uh, were basically reusing the song for a good purpose, like a public interest purpose of trying to get people vaccinated. But at the end of the day, an automated system is not really capable of taking these uh, elements into account. And instead, it's basically that you have to ask permission. And uh, so this is also what happened in this case, that at the end of the day, the video got unblocked or unmuted because it raised a lot of public attention and um, apparently somebody in the government picked up the phone and so they were able to sort it out. But of course, this is not really an option for people who may not have such a big social media following. Um, perhaps a, a slightly more sinister possibility that we have seen now in the United States and also in France is uh, police officers who are being filmed uh, playing music on their phones as an effort to try to interrupt a live stream. Um, so in this case, actually, uh, probably the rights holders themselves are not to blame for this attack vector. Um, uh, but it's basically an opportunity if you know that a particular type of copyright protected work does get blocked automatically, you would be able to um, uh, play it whenever something is being live streamed and in that uh, way interrupt the live stream. Um, and finally, there is also a problem with an erosion of the public domain that um, uh, the users who are, for example, uploading their own recordings of public domain works, such as uh, popular classical piano works to social media websites quite often get blocked because there are protected sound recordings of, a, uh, of those works. So even when the original musical work is in the public domain, the sound recording may still be protected and the filtering technology may not necessarily be able to distinguish between the two. So um, yeah, I decided to kind of take these practical examples of what is already happening today to um, illustrate the problem. Um, but I think there is sort of a new dimension that may come to this issue with the EU copyright directive entering into force. And quite, I think quite a lot of the details are going to change. Uh, so on the one hand, um, I think these uh, instances of overblocking are likely to increase because at the moment, platforms are actually relatively selective or can be selective about who gets access to this filtering technology. And you could say that is unfair because it tends to favor larger right holders. But uh, of course, this may also to some extent limit uh, the instances of abuse. Whereas in the future, if actually offering right holders these tools becomes mandatory, um, you could imagine that also the opportunities for abuse could increase. And the same is true because um, the copyright directive does not distinguish between different types of uh, copyright protected work. So those platforms that are only filtering for music at the moment might be required to filter for other types of content. Um, at the same time, of course, from a fundamental rights perspective, it makes a difference whether a private platform implements a filtering technology or whether there is a law that actually requires them to implement the filtering technology, even if it leads uh, to the blocking of legal content. So um, when the copyright directive comes into effect, this uh, is probably likely to exacerbate the problem, but also at the same time, um, offering some new opportunity for litigation. Um, the platforms, I think are put in quite a difficult position because they are faced with a direct liability. The safe harbor of the e-commerce directive no longer applies to them in case that they actually underblock. And even though Article 17 of the Copyright Directive says that legal content may not be blocked, so therefore you could say, well, there isn't really a problem for users then, or they might actually be better protected. But the problem is that the sanctions are not there. 
So uh, from the platform's perspective, if you're asked to do something impossible, which is to delete all the illegal content and leave online all the legal content, uh, if you know that you're not be going to be able to satisfy both of those ideas perfectly, you're probably going to look at what happens if you fail. And there, on the one hand, you have direct liability towards rights holders. And on the other hand, um, the sanctions for actually overblocking are not very well defined. Um, another problem is that uh, the users who become subject of overblocking are actually not really incentivized to exercise their rights for a number of reasons. Um, one is that at the point where your content gets blocked for uh, unjustified reasons, um, in a social media environment, quite often the damage is already done. Even if you can relatively easily have the content reinstated a week later, it's probably not going to be worth it, uh, which is why um, studies that have looked at uh, the existing notice and takedown regime have consistently found much higher rates of uh, false takedowns than actual user complaints. So the vast majority of users whose content gets taken down uh, for unjustified reasons will not complain about it. Um, I think another reason for this lack of user rights enforcement is a lack of knowledge. Um, most users don't actually know which copyright exceptions apply in their country and to what extent they can rely on those. And so they, they may end up being afraid uh, or simply not know that uh, they could uh, actually challenge a takedown decision. And uh, to some extent, on some platforms at least, I think there is also a disincentive to uh, challenge the decisions that are made by automated filters, because uh, challenging such a decision may lead to a copyright strike. So under the US uh, DMCA system, you have a provision that requires platforms to have in place a repeat infringer policy. And some platforms have uh, implemented this repeat infringer policy in a way that actually disincentivize cha challenging a decision by an upload filter. So basically users for all those reasons and also in some cases for lack of resources are not very well placed to individually enforce their rights against uh, false decisions by automated decision-making. Um, so Obviously, as soon as Article 17 comes into force, uh, it's no longer going to be a private platform decision to use upload filter, which means there is no question about whether or not the Charter of Fundamental Rights applies to these situations. If you have a law that actually leaves platforms no other choice than to use upload filters, then this law needs to be um, judged on the basis of the charter. So actually, uh, the government of Poland sort of beat us to the challenge because uh, just a few days after the uh, copyright directive was passed, um, it uh, put forward a challenge against parts of, legal, uh, of Article 17 with the European Court of Justice. And unfortunately, now that the uh, deadline for implementing Article 17 approaches, this court case has not been decided yet. Um, so obviously the existence of the court case is quite a good thing. It has saved us lots of time. If uh, somebody had to actually go to court after the law was implemented, it would have taken a lot longer. But uh, the challenge is also very narrow, unfortunately. It only challenges uh, the uh, compatibility of certain parts of Article 17 with the charter. So it may end up leaving some important questions open. Um, but as GFF, uh, we have decided to contribute to the academic debate around this court case. So we uh, published a study that um, tries to analyze the most pertinent uh, fundamental rights questions raised by Article 17. And so in our study, uh, we come to the conclusion that even though it states the opposite, um, Article 17 introduces a de facto general monitoring obligation um, because uh, in the past case law of the European Court of Justice, uh, the court has found in a copyright context that having to look at every single upload uh, from users or every single piece of content that is transmitted, even to just find matches with a single copyright protected work uh, would constitute 
a general monitoring obligation. This has been um, put forward, uh, for example, in the case of uh, McFadden. And only um, even if you, if you put forward a relatively narrow interpretation of the general monitoring obligation, only in a case where a court has uh, actually found that a particular use infringes copyright, there, it may be possible to require a stay down of that particular use of the copyright protected content. Um, Article 17 is a lot broader because it requires stay down of entire works, regardless of the context in which they are being used. And uh, it does so without a court order. Um, secondly, we also find uh, that the uh, provision of Article 17 um, constitutes prior restraint because uh, the um, provision requires platforms to block uh, particular copyright protected works without any court uh, decision constituting uh, illegality of the content that needs to be removed. So it's sort of irrespective of the context, a right holder just has to uh, claim ownership of a particular work and then uses of that work have to be blocked regardless of the context. And um, finally, uh, we also find that uh, the safeguards against uh, overblocking are insufficiently defined. So basically in Article 17, they are merely stated, at least the ex ante safeguards. It is said that there must not be blocking of illegal content, but um, Article 17 does not actually give member states uh, much guidance on how this should be achieved in practice. So um, the European Court of Justice is probably going to decide on this court case in the beginning of 2021. Uh, the Advocate General opinion is uh, due on the 15th of July. And so, of course, from the perspective of trying to prevent overblocking through litigation, um, our next steps with GFF are very much dependent on the outcome of that court case, because um, Member states are moving ahead with the implementation of Article 17. The deadline for implementation is already in June of this year, so just a few weeks from now. And even if the court decides next year that Article 17 as a whole is invalid, this is not going to automatically make the national implementations disappear. Um, you've seen this, for example, with the data retention directive, which was declared invalid by the European Court of Justice a few years ago. NGOs still had to actually bring court challenges against individual national implementations of data retention. And that work is still ongoing to try to actually um, give effect to the, to the ruling in its fullness. Um, so that is one possibility. Another possibility might be that the court doesn't declare Article 17 invalid. Um, but in this case, I would still expect that uh, the court would at least give some guidance about how it has to be interpreted in order to ensure the protection of the right uh, to freedom of expression. In this case, of course, we will have to see whether the individual national implementations, and for us, of course, uh, Germany is the most important, whether this implementation actually fulfills the requirements uh, uh, defined by the court. And um, so we may be able to, to start national litigation to challenge elements of the national implementations that fail to meet the court's requirements. And of course, there's also another uh, possibility, um, which is that some of those national copyright uh, uh, implementations actually introduce possibilities to challenge uh, overblocking uh, in the form of collective redress, either against fraudulent copyright claims by alleged right holders or systematic overblocking by the online platforms. So um, this is also something that we're looking at to what extent the national implementations might be uh, able to uh, serve as a basis for uh, challenges to systematic overblocking. And in this context, I think collective action is actually extremely important uh, because of the challenges that I have explained why individual users are very unlikely and very ill-equipped to actually um, challenge uh, uh, the removal of their content. Like if you're an individual user, 
and uh, you try to get an injunction, the best you're going to get is that the content gets put back online. But uh, if the same thing happens over and over again, basically that uh, certain types of legal expression get systematically blocked, the type of relief that you would want to have is not necessarily that it gets put back up, but that the platform actually has to change the way that it's doing content moderation in order to make sure that this doesn't happen to begin with so that they are, um, the legal system actually creates incentives for the platforms to do better. Um, so that's, I think, uh, why strategic litigation is necessary in this case, um, but also more broadly in copyright because uh, quite a lot of the user safeguards that exist in existing copyright law have never been tested in practice. Um, so if you take, for example, Article 6.4 of the InfoSoc Directive, which is another issue that we're looking at, uh, which is uh, basically saying that even though technological protection measures uh, may not be circumvented, um, users still have, uh, should have the possibility to benefit from copyright exceptions. So if you're buying an ebook, for example, and uh, you want to do research uh, using uh, methods such as text and data mining, um, you should be able to go to the right holder and they have to offer you the possibility to exercise your copyright exceptions. So this system exists on paper in every member state, but it has basically never been exercised, at least in Germany. And um, there is a, a collective redress possibility for uh, this right, which is something that we want to, to uh, try out. Um, because in practice, basically, uh, if you try to exercise this right, the results are quite often very dissatisfying. So for example, the, the UK Libraries and Archives Copyright Alliance tried to help a researcher to in, uh, get around the copyright uh, technological measures in this way. And basically, it took them months and months to even get a response from anybody who might be uh, in a position to help them. And ultimately, uh, the intellectual property office in the UK also took two months to tell them in the end that uh, their request was considered out of scope. So basically, just because the law says that users have this right, uh, this right doesn't exist in purpose uh, in practice if you don't know how to exercise it in a reasonable amount of time. So we're planning to do a test case on that. And our hope is that either uh, we will get a result outside of court where basically we can publish the results and tell people, okay, if you want to get around technological protection measures legally, here's how you can do it, or to get a ruling that actually fleshes out the requirements for rights holders to, to uh, provide this possibility at a reasonable amount of time. Um, Another area that we're quite interested in are institutional users of copyright exceptions, such as libraries and archives, because uh, with the copyright directive, they're receiving quite a lot of new possibilities to make works available, for example, through out of commerce uh, schemes. But because these out of commerce provisions are new, there are a lot of open legal questions about what exactly they can do. And uh, we hope to encourage them to um, actually try out these new provisions, because if nobody takes a calculated risk, um, basically they will not be able to make use of these new freedoms. Um, and finally, another issue that we're also working on is the question of private website blocking, where uh, in, the, uh, in Germany since recently, um, there is a conglomerate of uh, private internet service providers and private rights holders organizations um, agreeing on the DNS blocking of uh, websites that include significant amounts of copyright infringement. And because these, uh, with this website blocking is basically agreed upon through a private system, there is no more court involved that actually does a fundamental rights uh, assessment of weighing the impact of a lack of access to legal content against uh, the impact of the illegal content, because usually an individual website is going to have a mixture of legal and illegal content. And so uh, a fundamental rights uh, 
assessment before introducing website blockings is necessary in our opinion. So um, our goal more broadly is to, to answer a lot of the uh, most important legal questions around uh, the balance between um, intellectual property and other fundamental rights in uh, hopefully at a European level. And through this way also get a more um, harmonized conceptualization of users' rights under copyright law, uh, which I feel is uh, quite an underdeveloped system. The CJEU has done some pretty interesting rulings on uh, the fundamental rights importance of certain copyright exceptions, such as um, the recent rulings around Afghanistan papers uh, and, and others like it. So um, yeah, this is basically where we want to go. I, I will leave it at that. I'm very happy to also talk about my experiences in the parliament, how all of this fits together. Um, and yeah, looking forward to the discussion with all of you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. This was this was very rich. Um, so with this, I open the floor to uh, questions. Uh, you can either raise your hand, in which case I'll then call your name and you can um, directly post a question, or you can uh, also include it in the chat, in which case I'll pick it up and read it for our speaker. Okay. Um, in the meantime, Harshida, I see that you have your first question. Thank you, Julia. That was so interesting and insightful. Um, I had a, I have a, a question about intellect, intellectual property in Germany in general. Why do we see? Is there a historical reason, or why is why is in, in Germany that there's a slightly a higher shift towards intellectual property rights compared to other uh, fundamental rights like freedom of expression or you know, in general, why, why does we uh, see more of a tilt towards uh, IP? Mm. That is a good question. I mean, um, I, I would say on paper, the protection of intellectual property as a fundamental right is actually weaker in the German constitution than in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, because we have the protection of property, but we also have an explicit um, tying of the protection of property to the social good. So basically there's this concept that property also comes with an obligation towards the public. So on paper, it's not necessarily a stronger uh, protection than in other European countries. Um, but of course, uh, German politicians also had a hand in drafting the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So um, yeah, I, I don't really know. I mean, I could say that uh, there are quite uh, old and traditional publishing companies in Germany. Um, I think there is generally a relatively high uh, level of importance given to property rights. Um, but I don't really know why, why this is the case. And I, I'm also not sure if, at least in the comparison to other European countries, it's necessarily the case that uh, German um, protection of intellectual property is stricter. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Arshida. So I see a second question in the chat um, that is, uh, Mayang is asking whether, and this is in context of Article 17 challenge, whether Court of Justice basically has any possibility to suspend the application of the, the uh, sus suspend the application of, mm. of the directive before it's actually uh, implemented by the member states. Obviously, we know it mm. didn't happen, but is that a possibility? Well, I I don't think so. I mean, I don't think um, basically the the date of application is written into the directive, and I don't think it can be retroactively changed. But of course, uh, the European Commission has some uh, margin of discretion over whether it's going to start infringement proceedings right away against a country that has failed to implement the directive in time. And um, as we can tell, uh, the implementation deadline is just a few weeks from now and the vast majority of member states is going to fail to meet this deadline. So I think um, it's going to be interesting to see what the European Commission does because 
well, normally they, they should start uh, infringement proceedings if it's clear that member states are failing to meet the deadline. But in this case, it might be a special situation where you know that about six months from now or eight months from now, uh, the European Court of Justice is going to make this uh, uh, decision on a quite fundamental question uh, of yeah, whether a crucial provision of the directive is uh, valid. And I think member states are put in a, in a somewhat awkward position there because they can basically choose whether to fail to meet the deadline and risk infringement proceedings or they risk uh, introducing a law that may end up being uh, violating the charter. So I guess there is no real good solution for it. One thing that is being discussed in Germany is whether the national implementation um, can include uh, sort of a, a period an implementation period, um, also to give platforms time to actually implement the new provisions. Because I think realistically, uh, let's say the German parliament votes on its national implementation next week, I don't think that any platform is realistically going to be able to have all of the technical details implemented by 7th of June. So that might also be an option that the member states in their implementation say, okay, you have time until spring of next year or something like that. Interesting. I mean, there's an interesting precedent in that regard, uh, data retention directive, which was quite strongly uh, enforced by the uh, European Commission. Um, and I think some fines were even imposed um, uh, while the there was a pending challenge to the data retention directive. And then the question was whether the commission should return the money for um, finding a couple of countries for not um, properly implementing the directive, which was eventually held to be um, invalid. I see Luke um, with another question. Thanks, Martin, and thank you, Julia. Uh, I think I did meet you at LSC about seven or eight years ago when you were, well, when, when we were both much younger. And, and uh, as Martin said, it's been great to chart your career and, and the fact that, that, you, that, that you're still here and still fighting the good fight is, is really wonderful. Um, so I wanted to ask you two questions, if you don't mind. The first one is about, you know, everyone talks about lobbying in Washington and, you know, the sheer amounts of money that go into that. What happens in Brussels is much less well documented, and yet th that there are more accounts coming out all, all the time about about this. So I just wondered whether you, as as an MEP, experienced this firsthand, and whether you have any interesting stories that are not confidential that you can tell us about. And the second one then is about a paper that I commented on last year for the Modern Law Review, which was an empirical analysis of all the member state submissions to the Court of Justice on copyright matters. And essentially the authors gathered what they could. And it's, it's amazing that some of these member state submissions are not available. They had to use freedom of, uh, freedom of information requests, but they couldn't get everything. Um, so they got what they could. Um, and that was quite revealing as well, because it showed that certain states, France, for example, very pro rights holder, uh, in the submissions that they're making. And then the UK, in fairness, was often much more balanced in the submissions that, that were made, um, looking not just at rights holder, but also freedom of expression and other, other uh, things. So uh, I wanted to ask you whether you think the, the absence of, of the UK might affect how those submissions work now, because obviously the, the UK was making quite a lot of submissions missions and was a bit more balanced at least than some of the other big member states so you know could this have an impact on the way the okay um thank you very much for the questions uh, i will start with the lobbying um i think Yes, lobbying in Brussels is very significant, but I would say on the topic of copyright, probably money is not uh, the, the only or even the most significant factor. I find that a lot of um, very effective lobbying around copyright issues is built on quite long-standing relationships, which means that uh, older European um, entertainment companies, or media companies that have 
long lasting relationships with people in powerful positions uh, actually have the strongest lobbying impact. So uh, for example, um, a certain press publishing company um, uh, more or less made the rounds of prime ministers during the copyright negotiations and was able to completely flip the position of the council on the neighboring right for press publishers, which I don't think has that much to do with money, but it has more to do with basically having the phone numbers of the prime ministers in different uh, countries. So um, yeah, there, there has been quite a lot of that. Um, perhaps, I don't know, like a funny anecdote. Uh, so for example, there was uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, somewhat clumsy lobbying against the text and data mining exception from academic publishers. And I had quite a funny um, lobby meeting with a representative of Elsevier uh, who told me that basically text and data mining slows down the websites of academic publishers. And this is a health risk because then um, doctors in the emergency room will not be able to look up the academic papers before they have to uh, perform surgery. Um, which I found uh, quite funny, but um, yeah. So uh, I think, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to um, completely uh, be, be completely dismissive of lobbying because I think lobbying does fulfill uh, a useful purpose in politics to some extent because, um, well, most politicians will simply not have the time or the expertise to be aware of all. The, the consequences that a law might have on a particular industry. And I think it's perfectly legitimate for representatives of that industry to come to you and explain those impacts. But the problem is that uh, unless you, you are very well able to distinguish between you know, these horror stories that people tell you that have no basis in truth and actual um, problems, at some point you stop listening. And so I'm also wondering whether whether some of these hyperbolic lobbying strategies aren't actually counterproductive in the long run because they get politicians used to not believing anything you hear. Um, yeah, and on the question of uh, the submissions to the European Court of Justice, um, first of all, I think it's it's a very good idea to do freedom of information requests on any. Um, any uh, legislative uh, process that has finished or court cases that have has finished, because uh, I think it's such a rich resource uh, for academics. Also, for example, lawyers should be doing a lot more freedom of information requests to get the four column documents of trilogue negotiations where, you know, if you're trying to analyze uh, the intention of the legislator, you need to know how uh, the uh, text of the directive has evolved over time. And for that purpose, it's extremely useful to have all these documents. And unfortunately, uh, the institutions are not publishing them proactively as soon as uh, they are no longer secret. I think that would make a lot more sense. You know, uh, I think it's enough that in one court case, it was clarified that you can get the submissions after a court ruling. So then why don't they just get published proactively as soon uh, as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, I do think that uh, in, it's going to have an impact for the UK to leave. I mean, um, I studied political science and uh, some of the quantitative political science analyses said, oh, the UK leaving is going to mean that copyright policy is going to get more progressive. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. I mean, if you look at it from a purely quantitative point of view, they were able to show that more UK members of the European Parliament voted for ACTA than uh, members from other countries. But I do think that overall, sort of, if you look at it qualitatively, the, the arguments coming from UK politicians have been more nuanced on, um, on copyright law. And I would not be surprised for the same to be true for the, for the court submissions. So I guess maybe it would be useful to encourage other member states that also have a balanced approach to copyright to also make court submissions in copyright cases. I don't think you're going to change France's mind on that, but maybe somebody else can fill that role in the future. <laughs>
can I follow up on that? Um, given that um, these procedures before Court of Justice are basically member states, the commission, uh, um, and the commission talking to the courts about what they think the law should look like, um, isn't there finally time to open up the procedure to interventions in a similar way as the ACHR? is namely that also civil society could apply to the president of the court to intervene and that these uh, submissions would be taken into account because it always i always considered it to be strange that the only way you can get civil society to intervene is if they intervene on the national national level before the thing get uh, the case gets elevated to the um to the court um so don't you think it's time to actually sort of band together with other organizations to push for changes in the rules of procedure um, so that this is actually possible? Obviously, I know that they wouldn't probably uh, uh, sort of go and, and promote this uh, change themselves because it's gonna be extra work for them. But it, it seems to me that after the Lisbon Treaty and with the sort of excessive use of the charter, it's becoming um, just not acceptable anymore that it's just the states talking to the court uh, and the parties, random parties talking to the court uh, and no one else, especially given that we know that those states very often don't talk necessarily um, sort of out of their own volition, but because of some interest that uh, is, is sort of pushing them in that direction. What do you think about this? Yeah, I think it's a good point. Um, I, I think, especially when you're looking at freedom of expression, it is relevant that the member states' representatives are not representatives of the parliaments, but of the governments. So basically, you only have the majority in every given country intervening on behalf of the whole country. So especially in freedom of expression cases, I think that that also could lead to a certain bias where you're only basically hearing from the national ministries. And even though the European Parliament uh, may be able to intervene in cases, um, in that case, it's just the legal service of the European Parliament who is just going to argue that whatever the European Parliament passed is, uh, is uh, compatible with the Charter, but the, the legal service of the Parliament doesn't necessarily, you know, argue to, to try to defend the interests of the general population. So I do think there is a lack of uh, representation of civil society in those cases. Um, in Germany, we don't really have a tradition of amicus briefs either, but uh, to some extent, GFF just started sending them anyway. Um, and so there is now a little bit of a, a, a discussion in legal academic circles in Germany, whether there should be changes to the rules of procedures of our national courts um, to also allow an instrument such as an amicus brief. I think that would be a good idea to to go in that direction. I don't know how how realistic it is, um, but I think it, it it would definitely lead to a broader range of um, perspective being represented. Excellent. Uh, do we have more questions from the floor? Yes, so there is a question in the chat from Peter. You suggested it might be helpful if libraries and archives were willing to do more and perhaps take on a bit more risk. Are there any other areas in particular where you would hope to see more activities of this sort? Mm -hmm. um, so one area I think that would be really interesting is uh, lending of eBooks. So there was uh, the quite progressive ruling of the European Court of Justice in the VOB case, which uh, said that uh, the lending, the public lending right covers the lending of eBooks. Um, and so whether or not this is possible, it, it still depends on the national implementations. And for example, I don't know what the situation in, in the UK is. And of course now, uh, there is the question to what extent uh, the, the European Court of Justice case law even uh, is still relevant. But I think e-lending is definitely such a subject where um, just looking at the effects of the pandemic, it's abundantly clear 
that if libraries want to be able to fulfill their public interest mission, they have to be able to lend out ebooks, um, especially if their facilities are closed. And there is, you know, there are at least the beginnings of progressive in interpretation of uh, EU copyright law to facilitate that. So I think that would be an interesting area. Another area where it's probably going to be necessary to take calculated risks is with the new out of commerce regime, because um, basically the the new out of commerce rules are based on a system of extended collective licensing so there are going to be negotiations between libraries and collecting societies about making out of commerce collections available online but of course there are lots of member states and lots of types of works where no um uh, collecting society exists that is representative of a particular type of work and so I hope that lots of libraries will not be discouraged by the lack of an existing collecting society and make use of the fallback exception that is part of the law and basically make uh, the works available on their own initiative. And I think they would have good chances to actually, um, yeah, to have those schemes be validated in court. But of course, the, the first cultural heritage institution that makes rule, uh, use of these rules is going to take a legal risk and um, I hope they're going to do it anyway, because otherwise uh, these provisions will largely fall flat. Fascinating. So uh, unless there's additional question from the floor, I wanted to ask you, um, so you said you spent two months in the US. Um, A little bit more, I think six months or something uh, like that. But specifically reading about the strategic litigation history and culture in the US. So my question is, what did you learn for the European setting? Uh, what do we need to do to improve things? Because obviously we, I mean, in the area of digital rights, uh, there are some other areas that are a little bit more advanced, like you said. Um, in the area of digital rights, I guess the data retention is probably the, uh, the first precedent that uh, where many member states try to um, in many member states, we had sort of organized um, litigation against a piece of European law. Um, but what do we need to do? I mean, learning mm -hmm. from the US experience, what do we need to do to organize better? And obviously things have changed in the meantime. And how that kind of work in your view um, differs from, so strategic litigation differs from uh, trying to make change through politics. Yeah. Um... So I think uh, in order for strategic litigation to be successful, you can um, take two different approaches. You can take the approach where you um, actually take on a case that you think you're going to lose, but that is going to create outrage in the public uh, mind. So if you have a law that is very clearly um, not aligned with the um, sense of justice of the general population, you might be able to lose a case and still start a public debate. So um, for example, in Germany, and maybe maybe um, the person who spoke earlier was, was correct about uh, uh, Germany valuing property really highly. So GFF took a case about um, containering. So uh, um, basically taking food that has been thrown away by supermarket chains from the garbage uh, can. And um, basically the case was about whether that constitutes theft or not. And um, even though the uh, case was ultimately lost, everybody agrees that that doesn't make a lot of sense that you, know, you shouldn't be punished for stealing something that has been thrown in the garbage, especially sort of from an environmental point of view and so on. So I think, um, that is a reasonable approach. So even if you have a less uh, sort of malleable court system, then in the US, perhaps uh, it might make sense to still take on cases that are not particularly, um, yeah, not particularly hopeful. But um, I think the more promising strategy is to to try to find as sympathetic um, plaintiffs for cases where there is a genuine open legal question. Um, so for example, one case that GFF is currently pursuing 
is about um, the the rights of uh, non-binary parents under German family law, where basically the the legal system quite openly discriminates against um, LGBT parents, and the chances are pretty good by by just um, pursuing a case like that that you would actually have uh, an unconstitutional law overturned. Um, I don't think we need to hide too much uh, behind the US because there actually is uh, a tendency, I would say, of successful strategic litigation in, in certain fields that might not work in the same way in the US. So for example, in Germany, there's uh, just recently been a partial success by the climate movement, Fridays for Future, um, to overturn parts of um, the German climate law because it fails to um, reduce climate emissions in a manner that uh, uh, is going to be fair to future generations, basically. And this litigation would not have been successful if Germany had not written environmental protection into its constitution in the 1990s, when probably everybody thought it was just a blind phrase without uh, a, a lot of meaning. So I think it's useful to also look at these sort of, um, yeah, undefined statements in existing European constitutions or European legal systems and try to actually build a case based on them. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if that answers the question. I think um, funding is, of course, always an issue, but at least in Germany, it's, it's not such a huge issue because the court costs are capped um, to some extent. So I think that is uh, also when you're thinking about which country in the EU you want to pursue strategic litigation, that is, of course, also an important question that you have to look at how, what is the financial risk of actual, uh, actually um, pursuing a court case? And of course, if you have a legal system where uh, you could be subjected to really high, high costs if you lose, that might also be something that discourages NGOs from pursuing litigation. Excellent. Great. So this gives us a lot of hope <laughs> uh, for the coming years that there will be interesting cases um, that we can analyze and. Uh, and that can help um, help us change um, the landscape of digital rights. Well, Julia, uh, thank you so much for, for taking time and talking to us. Um, please join me in thanking uh, Julia. Um, thank you. Um, thanks a lot. This was this was really fascinating. Um, and yeah, for uh, for everyone, I think the session uh, was recorded. So in case, as you could see in the right top uh, corner, so in case uh, you want to later come back to this. Uh, it will be at a, on the LSE website at some point. I cannot tell you when. Um, and yeah, just follow the LSE website uh, section events for future events, and we'll be happy to see you again. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>